Hello and welcome to another episode of MFM's podcast, host called Beyond the White Coat, the podcast that takes you on an unforgettable journey into the lives of doctors. I'm Dr. Selina, founder of Medic Footprints Malaysia. It's a platform that connects doctors to diverse careers in healthcare. Now, if you've not followed our podcast, be sure to hit that follow button and follow our channel. Now, in today's podcast, it's going to be a little different. In today's episode, we're going to be exploring what are the options for contract doctors who still want to continue practicing medicine. Now, Dr. Basima Jamal left KKM to become a MO in a primary care department at a university hospital. She's also a manager at one of the university hospital's clinics. She's been with the university hospital for almost three years now. Now, Dr. Besima is an old friend of MFM. She was with us from the very, very beginning. And she, she was the lead writer and editor at our MFM website when we first began our operations. Welcome, Besima. It's nice to have you back. It's nice to be here. Thank you for having me. Okay, so uh, Besima, maybe just tell me, tell the, the listeners a little bit about your journey, you know, how did you start? Um, and you left your civil position in the MOH, uh, and then you moved to a university hospital. Tell, tell us a bit about that journey. Okay, so um, I did my medical degree in the United Kingdom under sponsorship. So when I came back, I did the traditional pathway. So I did my husbandship in a KKM hospital. And after that, after a period of as a floating MO, um, then I started my MO ship in a different hospital, my home state. And at that time, when I found out that um, at the end of my MO ship, the last year of my contract, when I found out that they were going to just renew my contract, I was very disappointed. Partly because um, at that time, I was probably the second batch who was offered contract. And just hearing from my seniors from the first batch that I think about 50% of them actually did get a permanent position. I was quite disappointed. Um, I worked really hard to pass one of my papers for parallel pathway training. By the end of my housemanship, I already passed the first kind of exam. So I was hoping that would have given me an edge, but um, it didn't. So I was quite frustrated being, a, being unable to secure a permanent position. So I started looking for options outside of the MOH. And at that time, I really wanted to continue doing clinicals. I wasn't considering anything beyond that. So um, one opportunity that came up my way was um, position as a service MO at a university hospital. Uh, and so I went for the interview and yeah, I got it. So that was my ticket out of KKM from a contract position. And they were offering me a permanent position. So it was a no-brainer. Did you know um, at the beginning, like as in when you first graduated and you joined the workforce, did you know about this contract system? So the contract system was announced when I was a uh, final year medical student. And at that time, there was a huge furor among medical students, even overseas. A lot of people were like, oh no, I'm not going to come back after this. I'm just going to stay in the UK and continue working there. Um, so at that time, because it was just announced, there was a lot of consternation and frustration, but also because it was just started, there was still a lot of optimism. They were like, oh, it's just going to be for housemanship. Once you become an MO, you're going to be permanent. So I would say um, people were still kind of hopeful that it's still going to be okay at the end of it. But it was once we started working and the first batch right before me, so a few months before I started um, as a housemanship, when we saw what happened to them, then we were kind of like confronted with the reality that we were like, okay, it's bad. <laughs> it's not going to be what we thought it's going to be. And um, I think that made a lot of us panic and started looking for what are our options. And at that time, it was really frustrating because in Malaysia, there were not a lot of people who were talking about those options outside of KKM. And so we were kind of left blindsided. So uh, right now, your position in the university hospital, are you considered um, a civil servant still? Yes. So it's a public university. So the positions are still under JPA. So we are still government servants. 
Um, the only difference is we're not under KKM, we're under KPT, so Kementerian Pengajian Tinggi. So we're still UD, we are still um, under the post of Pegawai Perubatan, just under a different ministry. So what was the process? How did you move into uh, this university hospital? Okay, so I found out about the opening and I applied for the position. There was an interview. So uh, after, during the interview, they asked you things like your experience, what your interests are, what are the fields of specialty that you want to do. And a few months after the interview, they let uh, us know that we were successful. And if we wanted the position to reply and um, basically for duty for, for duty. And I found out about um, my application being successful around December of 2019. So when COVID hit, um, it was pretty bad at that time being in KKM. So I was kind of glad that at that time I already had a way out and I left KKM right at the end of my contract. So my contract was ending in May. So I, I didn't terminate my contract. Basically I chose not to renew. So it was just like, it just naturally ended. And a month later, I reported for duty at my university hospital. Okay, what's, what was the university's um, criteria? Is, is there a clear criteria on how they choose their MOs? Okay, so the application criteria was quite clear. So they, um, they basically had your educational qualifications and your qualifications for finishing housemanship and the documentation that you needed to prove that. But other than that, um, in terms of the interview process, their main interest was in why you chose university hospital and number two they were interested in what field of specialty that you were interested in so they had positions in specific um, specialties that they wanted to fill up but beyond that um, they didn't make it clear whether they valued certain qualities more than others okay um is there a set pathway for you now that you're in a university hospital in terms of your career okay so this is something that I only found out after I went to university hospital. So when you go into a university setting as an academic um, service MO, people might confuse this with becoming a lecturer. It's a very different pathway. So when you go into university hospital as a service MO, your career pathway is basically similar to a KKM MO. So you have to do your specialty training, then become a specialist and you are doing clinical work 80% of the time and 20% of the time you do teaching because in a university, you have teaching medical students, but that's like a very small portion of your time. Whereas if you want to be a lecturer in a medical school, it's a totally different pathway. You apply to become a trainee lecturer and then they will send you to do your master's uh, at the expense of the university. And after that, you are bonded to university to serve as a lecturer once you become a specialist. So in that sense, when you're a lecturer, you 80% of your time is academic, teaching, research, and then 20% of your time you're practicing as a clinician. So now for me as a service MO, my pathway is the same in the sense that I have to do specialty training. However, please be warned that um, if you are a service MO, you can only do masters in your own university. So uh, different from a lecturer, you, they will send you to do your master's. Um, and if you are unfortunate enough to want to do a specialty, which master is not, um, it's not a course that is provided by your university, then the only option for you is a parallel pathway. So bearing that in mind, if the specialty you want to do is a parallel pathway that's recognized, it should be fine. But if it isn't, if it's a master um, and you are service MO, there is no path for you to progress into specialist training. You have to either wait for university to offer that master program or transition into the lecturer and uh, become a trainee lecturer, be set to do your master's and then come back to become a lecturer rather than a clinician. So this is something that I only found out once I joined the university hospital and a lot of people are not aware of this. In fact, um, because our university hospital is quite new, even the administrative staff were not aware of this, that you can't send a service MO to do their master's because their service, they're running the service. 
you can't send them off for four years and have no one to run the service. So progression in career pathway in university hospitals is definitely a stumbling block. I see. So just an example of say I want to be a uh, internal medicine specialist. So how would the pathway be if I was in this university hospital? If you were a service MO, you have to do MRCP. Again, MRCP um, is a recognized pathway. There's logbooks. Uh, NSR is very aware of the requirements. So it's quite easy to get NSR registration. But you are not KKM MO. So you technically, you kind of use KKM logbooks. You have to get approved logbook by your university that's approved by MRCP board. And then do your MRCP at your own expense, at your own time, uh, and then become a specialist. And then Gazetman will still be in KKM Hospital. So usually the university will facilitate this by helping you to um, apply to have Gazetman process in KKM Hospital. Some universities offer to uh, kind of sponsor part or all of your MRCP studies, like exams and all, but usually that will involve a bond as well. So what if I want to become, say, a surgeon? So what would the pathway be like? Okay, so surgeons are one of the pathways where the parallel pathway is either not recognized or is kind of like partially recognized. So that's the struggle. So if you're a service MO and you want to do a master's, there is no pathway for that at the moment. However, um, a lot of the university hospitals are starting to recognize that this is a problem because their service at was cannot progress. So they are starting to look at um, how they're going to facilitate MOs from universities who don't have that master program to go to other university hospitals to do their masters. But currently, that is not possible yet. Let's say if I am in a university hospital that does have a master for surgery, I can do that at my own university, yes. If my hospital does not, uh, my university hospital does not um, offer master in surgery, I'm stuck. So uh, after sounds... years out, you're stuck. Yeah, it sounds like there's a lot of challenges for doctors here in Malaysia if they want to become a specialist. Yeah, it's a lot of um, unnecessary bureaucracy, but at least the younger people are starting to recognize this problem and are trying to kind of build bridges to make this actually happen, but it's a very slow process. So maybe in five years time will be different, but currently it's a huge obstacle to service and most progressing. I see. So can you explain more about your position as a service MO in a university hospital? Okay, so I am currently in the primary care department. So similar to clinic kesehatan. So I see uh, outpatients, antenatal patients, pediatric patients coming for their routine immunization and checkups. Um, because uh, my university hospital has two different clinics, so we have one clinic which is within the campus specifically for staff and students. We do have another clinic which serves staff, student, and also their families and the public. So it's very similar to working like in the GP. So you see public patients, you charge them, um, but our services are a lot more varied compared to like clinic kesehatan or GP because we do have a clinical specialists from the lecturer side who come and offer specialist clinic services. So it's quite fun in a way that it's almost like a partial hospital outpatient clinic service where you have outpatient specialist clinics and the general outpatient clinics. Okay, well, was it tough for you to make that decision? Because earlier you mentioned it was a no-brainer because they offered you a permanent position, right? But yes. was it still tough? Because for me, I I was okay. I was in that uh, permanent um, the old system where you just get absorbed. You know, even at that point. Just leaving clinic, uh, government service and coming out to start medical footprints, it was scary, you know. It, it was like cutting off my umbilical cord and jumping into something else. So what was that process like for you? I think it was really hard initially to even consider applying because, like you said, for us, the, the thought process when you go into medical school is like, 
I come out, I join KKM, I'm in KKM forever, and then I retire. So it was like a huge jump from that to considering life outside of KKM. But I think what made it a lot easier for me, kind of like pushed me off the cliff, was the fact that it all happened around the COVID pandemic. So at that time, uh, when my contract was ending, it was right in the peak of the pandemic. I was in a tertiary hospital. We were having a lot of COVID patients. And at that time, I was also pregnant with my first child. Um, we were split into COVID and non-COVID team teams. So because I was pregnant, I was in non-COVID team. And because our workforce is so understaffed, I was doing EOD on calls in my third um, trimester. <laughs> oh, it was a nightmare. Wow. I, 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 that I, must have been hard for you. Yes. Um, and it was very scary because it was at the beginning of the pandemic. People didn't really know what COVID is. Uh, what it does to your body, do we have treatments available? And as a pregnant mother, I felt really vulnerable being the front line. So I think that was kind of the straw that broke the camel's back because um, a lot of the fear and anxiety related to the pandemic and being a mom kind of pushed me to consider leaving KKM. So I think that's what made my decision easier than probably other people who weren't in that kind of situation. But even then, after I left, there was a lot of like, what if I'm doing the wrong thing? What if I can't progress? Especially when I knew about all the the problems with progression in career and service MO in university hospitals. But so far till now, I haven't regretted my decision just because it made me able to achieve the other priorities I have in life, like work-life balance. And it's made me see a wider horizon outside of KKM that I didn't know existed. Okay, so you are um, the few that I know of have experienced a, um, you know, the work like in um, in KKM and then was it like being a doctor in a university hospital? How would you compare this to? Okay, so as a service employee, you'll find that your job scope is very similar to someone who is of a similar grade in a KKM hospital. However, the only difference is when you are in a university hospital, especially when you're in a kind of a newer one that is just trying to um, build up, you'll find that even though you're at a lower grade, because there are few people who are senior than you, you have to take up a lot of administrative roles. So one of the roles that I've started to take up uh, is as a manager of one of our clinics. So as a manager, I would have to deal with the administrative side, including like budgets, asset management, um, drug procurement. And these are all things that very new to me that I would never have been exposed if I was in KKM. It would be just like go to war, see patients, go home. But now I have a lot more to do outside of that scope. So it's interesting in a way that you learn a lot of things that you probably weren't aware of before especially the bureaucracy side of things and you understand why certain things are so difficult to change. Um, so in that sense, you kind of get to experience the side of um, management that you probably wouldn't have been exposed to in KKM. The second thing would be when you're in a university hospital, you get a lot more exposure to teaching and research. So there's a lot of um, push from the management and also from the faculty side to get even service MOs involved in research, um, even if it's just collecting data and also in teaching medical students. So you will, even if you're not in, a, if you're in a tertiary hospital at KKM, you probably see medical students a lot, but in district hospitals, you probably won't. So um, there's a lot of involvement in student exams. You can join as a mock examiner. Uh, so that's fun because I do enjoy teaching. So that was one of the perks that I actually enjoy joining in university hospital. Uh, sounds like it's because KKM is such a mature system. Um, they've already sort of compartmentalized things. But yeah. uh, in the university hospital where things are new, you would have to wear more than one hat. Yes. Again, this is probably right for my institution because it's quite a new one. If you went to somewhere a lot more established, like the big guns, like maybe UM or USM, 
UITM, it might be very different. So this is my experience in kind of a new university hospital, which might be different from more, the more established ones. Okay. Did you enjoy doing all the clinical work? Was it something that you said, hey boss, give this to me, or you were, it was dumped onto you? Give me the admin roles. Yes. <laughs> Definitely dumped. <laughs> Because there's um, there's so few of us who are kind even for me, just three years in the university is kind of considered more senior than the other people who've probably just been in one year. So it was kind of dumb to me. And um, initially, I was really resistant because you want, you want to do clinical work, basically. That's why you became a doctor. And uh, it was very hard to learn. It was a very steep learning curve because it's so new to you. Nev- I've never made Surat Rasanis since after SP. <laughs> so, um, but after a while, I think I I was really glad that I took up the role because I learned a lot of the management side of things that made me become more aware of how the system is kind of making it so difficult for us to change things. And now that I'm aware of how things work, I find that I can figure out how are the ways that I can work through that bureaucracy system and then initiate change because like we know about the old dinosaurs, right? In the system, there are people, people will eventually leave. So the younger ones will rise up. However, if the system itself makes it difficult for you to initiate and implement change, it will kind of tamp down your passion after a while because you get so frustrated clawing at the wall. Now that I'm in a position to learn about the system from really early on, I can then start chipping at it bit by bit until we get through that wall. Okay, so if I hear you correctly, you're saying that now that because you're in that administrative side, you feel that you have more power to uh, execute change. Yes. Though it may be a long process. It's going to be a long process. I don't expect to be able to implement large changes probably for the next five or 10 years. But the important thing is we start now so that we can start making headway, including things as simple as just changing the work culture in the the small clinic that I manage. It's not even the whole university hospital. But I think that will slowly kind of bring a rippling change to other places within the institution. And from the ground up, we can start bringing culture change and hopefully a change in mentality as well, especially when it comes to, um, you know, a lot, a lot of people come in from KKM from a lot of toxic workplace culture and whether consciously or subconsciously, we bring a bit of that with us. So just starting to change that from my clinic, how we interact with our colleagues, with our nurses, with our patients, just starting from there is the journey that I hope that hopefully in five, 10 years down the line, will make a big change to not just the workplace culture, but to the system and the bureaucracy that we're working in. Well, it sounds like um, there are a lot of the younger doctors that want to make change. And I think this is the time where actually change will start taking place because the younger ones are rising up. Yes. Okay, so what would your advice be for young doctors like in terms of mindset or skill? I mean, for those that are still feeling that they're stuck in KKM because of the contract system, like feeling that there's no um, like there's no future. A lot of them tell me they cannot plan their future because they don't know what's going to happen. I can relate because... So what uh, would your advice be for this, guys? I can really relate because my husband is still in KKM and still in that contract position. So I can relate to the frustration a lot of people are feeling. Um, my, for me, what worked for me was just keeping, always keep your options open. And this means a lot more than just clinical side. Keep your options upon, open beyond that. So what are my skills aside from being a doctor? What are my interests? What are my passions aside from being a doctor? A lot of us have a lot of hobbies, but we just consider them as, you know, hobbies. Or we have skills that we know uh, are useful, but we think of them as, you know, they're not related to my job. But those skills, those hobbies are really important for you when you're considering like non-clinical job options. So I think for a lot of people, because we have this mindset that 
I wanted to become a doctor because I wanted to see patients. But there are a lot of ways that you can help patients beyond just being a clinician. And I think one of the ways MFM is facilitating that is kind of providing information to people that they might not have been aware of that, look, they are doctors successful in this clinical role outside of KKM. They are doctors successful in this non-clinical role outside of KKM. And how are, you know, the practical steps that you can do to achieve that and to reach that. So I think the, the most important advice is keep your options open, be flexible and adapt to what your priorities are at that time. Well, thanks, Besima. It's been uh, really great to touch base again with you and, you know, to see how far you've progressed because I know we've connected in 2020, you were part of us and you were struggling and now three years on, it's really nice to see how you've matured and, you know, how you can now advise the younger doctors and making changes. I'm glad that I got to know MFM when we were still in our little chick fledgling stage. And I've seen how MFM grow as well. And that's inspired me to kind of do better as well. So it's a, it's a two way, two way street. Thank you so much. Thanks, Basima. Okay, everyone. I hope you've enjoyed listening to our discussion with Dr. Basima. Uh, we hope your story has inspired you to see that there are many options for you to continue to impact patients' care. And by the way, we have a healthcare diverse careers conference and exhibition that's coming up in August. Um, we are going to have uh, all doctors who have transitioned into other careers. They will come and share their experience on how you can uh, find your niche and make that successful career change. And if you want to explore more alternative on career path in healthcare, visit our website at www.medicfootprints.com.my. Thank you for watching and we will see you in our next episode.